Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 113 of Confessions of a Market Maker. I'm your co-host, Ray, a.k.a. All Day Ray, a.k.a. Ray Diamonds. And I'm joined here by my exceptional co-host, former market maker of 20 years and current day retail trader, the Vancouver heartthrob, a man who was never worried about the outcome, only his income, the proper villain. JJ, how's it going? Hey, good brother. How are you? I'm doing good, man. And our guest today is on the cutting edge of understanding the impacts of emotions on investment decision making. Rethink founder and CEO. She leverages her background in neuroscience and modern psychoanalysis to solve the mental mysteries of successful investing, trading, competing, and leading teams. She's known for her uncanny effectiveness in resolving mental blocks and decision conundrums. An in-demand de in speaker, she's keynoted for UBS, Credit Suisse, MIT Sloan Fellows, Harvard Business School, and the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Association, author of Market Mind Games. Of course, I'm talking about Denise Shell. Denise, how's it going? Hey, well, thanks for having me. Oh, thanks so much. Uh, definitely long overdue. Uh, that we've had you on. Um, Denise, uh, I always like to open the podcast on like a relatively light note, maybe like off topic question. I'm sure you get asked about this every podcast that you do, but the, but you know, the let me guess, ones... let me guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Here we go. Yeah. You Here already know. Go. I I have to ask for the listeners that maybe are, are not familiar uh, with you. Um, billions uh you've you've had a lawsuit with billions the the character uh wendy um you claim was based off of you do you do you mind just sharing with the listeners and maybe just some background um on that Gosh. yeah i don't mind at all the question is like stop me you know because i have so many data points um, <laughs> what happened was andrew ross sarkin called me well he actually emailed me in 2015 and asked me if i would do him a favor which was meet with this actress that he was involved and i didn't know anything about it at the time so I was like, sure. But I was like, this is a little weird. And I'm thinking I'm going to have a glass of wine with her at you know, some restaurant in New York. And the next thing I know, that had turned into a meeting in the writer's room. And by the time I got there, she wasn't even there. And so I sort of knew right off the bat that there was some sort of bait and switch plan there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I stayed for a couple hours, but I thought, you know, I'm starting to tell them too much. And she got there very late. And so I decided to cut the meeting short and like say, look, you know, if you guys want me to work with you, fine, we can talk about that. And they were talking about like how I could continue to work with them. And then Maggie, I always tend to call her Wendy, but her real name's Maggie, says, hey, Brian, you know, you got to read her book. And because my book, Market Mind Games, is written as a fictional story, I was embarrassed in front of you know a professional storyteller that had written multiple movies and i say so brian just say so you no know, it's written as a fiction story and the man's head blows off what do you mean how can it be i don't understand blah 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 blah. and i was like why is he getting so upset really? well anyway i came to find out that like if it's a fictional story you're more suspect of copyright i didn't know that at the time i was like and he had been sued for rounders for copyright no, I didn't know that at the time. Oh, either. really? Yes, yes, oh. yes. I am now friends with the person who really wrote Rounders, who sued him <laughs> for copyright. His name is Jeffrey Allen Grosso. He's recently written a book about it. I mean, he sued Weinstein, but Koppelman was part of the lawsuit. Well, anyway, that's why Brian went crazy. I didn't know at the time. So, you know, there's millions and millions and millions of details. But later I come to find out that Sorkin really, Sorkin wrote the pilot. Sorkin had used my book for the pilot. Wendy is from Ohio. I'm from Ohio. The first words I, I say as my fictional coaching persona in my book are her first words in the episode. Like the, the statistical odds of her being from Ohio and using the exact same words in the exact same order are like 0. 0.0003 chance. You know, like it's just not <laughs> possible. Um, but really what happened was then Sorkin and Koppelman made an agreement to keep me off CNBC and out of the New York media because Koppelman basically didn't want people to know it was based on me. And that's really why I sued them because mm -hmm. I thought it was really, frankly, damn nasty of them to like, you know, I have a small consulting company, right? And they just cut me off at the knees in terms of, so anyway, as it turns out though, you know, lots of years and lots of crazy things later and calls from the writer's room and CNBC producers telling me things behind the scenes 
I lost not only the general court or whatever it's called, but and the uh, appeals court. Mm-hmm. And in the end, I realized it was just like the show. Like I lived an episode of the show. There was a a student of one of their lawyers working for the judge at the time. Mm. There like, you go. It's just corrupt. Yep. The, and I uh, never had a chance. It wouldn't matter if it was you, me, the man on the moon. None of us yeah. ever had a chance against CNBC and NBC and that judge and their lawyers. So it was a learning experience, to put it mildly. <laughs> oh, sorry you had to go through that. I mean, I, I lived in Vancouver for 27 years, so I'm, I'm intimately familiar with people who work in the movie industry. And, and being starting in, in the penny stock market, I'll tell you the movie industry is more cutthroat than, than the market. That is... That 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 is those guys. They you know, they'll they'll tear the flesh off your bones. They're just yeah, so I learned. Hard. Like in the process yeah. of the you know, it's Sorkin originally contacted me in August of 2015, and I ultimately lost in the appeals court. I guess it would have been July of 21. So six years. Like in that six years, I had so many people come to me and tell me like their stories and to say things like, and I couldn't go to court, you know, I didn't have enough money to hire a lawyer or like, like, mm-hmm. I hope you win because like, and, and I learned, I mean, in summer 2020, we did get a call from someone in the writer's room who said, everything you're saying and more is true. Like, I'm like, well, thank you. But the court is not going to believe me, but yeah. So I learned that and I learned, you know, real life is just like the show, but I don't know. You know, I I wonder sometimes if I knew then what I know now, like if I knew that I was going to live an episode and I was going to lose out of corruption, would I have done it? You know, I don't know that I would. At the at the the final thing that made me decide to actually file the lawsuit was I'm like, look, I coach Olympic athletes, I coach billion dollar portfolio managers. The Olympic athlete that I'm most well known for coaching is snowboard cross, which is that five, six snowboarders racing oh, down yeah. this course. And it's a bit death defying. Sure. And then, you know, some of my portfolio managers, I'm helping them make, you know, decisions that could cost them a hundred million dollars. And I'm like, mm-hmm. how do I have the right to have people face their fears? Like, and take on these challenges if mm. I'm at my point of that and I don't do it. Like I couldn't stand not doing it from that perspective. Makes sense. So I had no idea what I was getting into. <laughs> um, but it's also, I mean, through the articles about it and whatnot, I like I spoke in Hong Kong for Credit Suisse because they read about it in a Bloomberg article. So wow. you know, there was there's been some upside to it. I mean, there are definitely people out there who think I'm the crazy woman who sued billions, <laughs> who's just trying to cat blah, 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 blah. Well, yeah, anybody... Those, who, yeah. those people have never worked in Hollywood. They've never been... They've never had to, to sit in front of a movie producer or, or see how that business works, so... you know. Well, and then I got another call, and then I'll stop. Like, I literally, I was with someone, a client the other day at a brunch. They came to Park City, and I'm like, stop me after three data points. Well, I, they, I finally was able to stop myself after seven, but I'll just say this. After it was all over, I got a, a call from the daughter-in-law of a very famous writer. If I said the name, you would know. And she said, you had a copyright case in front of George Daniels, right? And I said, yeah. I mean, you had Elizabeth McNamara as, as CBS's attorney. I said, right. She said, we want to know if you'll participate in you know, some sort of action because there's like seven or eight of us who have gone through the exact same sequence of taking a copyright or intellectual property case, being in front of Daniels with McNamara on the other side. And like, they all got dismissed for the same kinds of reasons and the same kinds of mistakes. Now, nothing's happened with that, but you know, just like you say, JJ. Incredible. I, I didn't, I didn't know that about rounders. Uh, neither that was, you know, being a poker player, that was, you know, that was a, that was probably one of the, one of the movies that actually really kind of depicted poker pretty well. Um, and just like the grind of poker and like the, the, you know, what poker can be behind the scenes. Um, I yeah. can't think of the name of it right now, but Google Jeffrey Allen Grosso, G R O S S O. Mm-hmm. He recently, he just recently came out with a book about mm-hmm. writing it, sending it to Weinstein, how it mm-hmm. got made, how he filed a lawsuit. He did actually win some things. I can't okay. remember exactly at the appeals court. He did get a ruling in his favor, but he didn't really win. 
Right. But that was why I, I told you the beginning of the story, because that's why Brian Koppelman, as soon as I said it's written as a fictional story, because I'm embarrassed. Yeah, he got He's upset. like, wait, what? What happened? Yeah. He's like, I, I was uh, like, I mean, like, I'm, like, I'm losing my mind. Like, why is he getting yeah. so mad about that? The, the lawyer in him is going off in his head. Well, he, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's amazing. If you actually, there's a movie made in the 80s called The Player with Tim Robbins. Mm -hmm. And if you see that movie, it is exactly the same storyline where they steal a guy's work, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or that, you know, and it's just the same thing. And you see it back there and, and it, it's, yeah. They actually even make movies about what happened to you. Yeah. yeah. I've had a lot of people tell me I should write the story of what happened and I should make a movie about what happened. I feel like, you know, if that's ever going to happen, someone's going to come to me and say, let's do this. Um, I do have lots of gory details. Mm. Like the CNBC producer saying to someone, yeah, I love her. She's great, but I'm not allowed to have her on anymore. Yeah. Wow. Stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? Here's the thing. I, just from my personal point of view, that character is really not that likable. So maybe it's a good thing, right? <laughs> I don't know. I stopped, watching, yeah, I, I stopped yeah. watching a few seasons ago. I stopped right? watching. I, I, would, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't trust her as far as I could throw her. So I mean, well, yeah, she in the end, she's not. I mean, that's one of the things they like weave this line. Like at the beginning, is she trustworthy? Is she not? You know, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it got. We watch it like when we can't think of anything else to watch, basically. <laughs> and you know, it got really kind of pathetic there for a while. It did actually get a little bit better. Yeah, um, it's about to come out again. She, by the way, Maggie herself is she's like wonderful and really sweet and really nice. Now she got caught up in all of it. There's a, I think it's an LA Times interview where they really grill her how she studied the character. And oh, she's like shit. looking up at the sky. <laughs> going, I, I, I talked to Tony Robbins and we're like, yeah, right. We to you know, she knew she was lying, but I'm sure they told her she was never allowed to mention my name. Oh, of course. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's uh, that's what I was gonna say. I I like the actors and actresses. I mean, uh, what's mm -hmm. his name who plays Axe? Damian Lewis, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you got to. Well, well, let's move on. We we I think let's we we've on. talked long yeah. enough about this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even people probably not listening, but no, we got some good stuff here coming up. Um, I just got to uh, take a quick second to shout out our good friends of the podcast, Apex Trader and Top Step Funding. Any listeners of this podcast that have the skills to pass an evaluation can become a prop trader, fully funded by either Apex or Top Step Funding. Our own. Micro E futures trading community has many members who are now fully funded. No need to trade with your own money. You can keep 90% of the profits. To learn more, you can visit our website at microefutures.com. Denise, so I, th I think a, a fact that um, I'm sure people appreciate about uh, appreciate um, about you is that you started off um, as a trader. Um, I feel people like feel they could trust a, a coach or an advisor who's actually done it. Like you've been, been in the trenches themselves. Um, so could you just like tell us about the start of your career and how you became a trader? Yeah. So the truth is I was dating a floor trader from the SIBO. His acronym was ZAP. He was no longer on the floor. And he kept telling me, like I did it for two or three years. He kept telling me I would be a good trader. And I'd be like, you guys go down there and do this like weird thing. Where you're like... <laughs> and so then he, one day he brought me a um, brochure for a weather future seat. He's like, you should buy one of these. And I'm like, weather future seat like yeah right well in any event um so i was just like you're crazy so i went to graduate school in well the neuroscience of psychoanalysis is what turned out to be the university of chicago and as i was finishing i was walking down the south street with him we turned left he saw a friend from the floor and said like hey you have to come we're building an upstairs trading firm this was the summer of 1994 Oh, okay. and like explaining all how this upstairs trading firm was going to work which didn't exist really because you didn't get Yep. full real-time quotes or you're just starting to be able to get real-time quotes and so my friend says well why don't you come keep track of our p l because you also didn't get intraday p l and we'll teach you to trade you're just writing that silly research paper thing that you're doing whatever <laughs> that is so sure enough within three months i'd funded my own account and they were on their own for their p l and then i um the place the shop that i was at was a fairly um mean reversion kind of market making and the market made sense to me in terms of momentum i could see like groups of stocks move so i moved and went to schoenfeld and got to sit next to now a famous hedge fund manager dimitri baliasny um, and learned to trade intraday momentum basically and then 
by some crazy twist of fate, somebody asked me to come to New York and build a day trading desk within a market making firm. Okay. So that's how I got from Chicago to New York. Um, then I was basically still doing that even after I started coaching. Um, there came a point where I was not intraday trading as much anymore, but that's how I got started. I turned left off the sale onto Jackson. Mm-hmm. Nice. So, <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, so bridge the gap for us now. So how did the whole consulting, advising, coaching, how did, how did you uh, work your way into that? So it, I was studying modern psychoanalysis kind of as a hobby. Like I was taking some classes at this tiny little institute while I was trading at a prop firm in New York, whose name I don't even remember right now, Empire Trading or something, I don't remember. But, and the, the psychoanalyst said, could we publish your master's thesis? And I'm like, you could, but you're going to look idiotic because it's 10 years old and neuroscience moves faster than that. But I thought, oh, it'd be kind of cool to have an academic mm-hmm. paper published. So I said, I'll update it. And at the time, Antonio Damasio, who's now at USC, he wrote a book called Descartes' Error, as well as a number of other books. But basically, he has shown you can't make a decision without emotion. And I was like, what? Like every piece of training psychology I'd written was take emotion out of it. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, if you did, you couldn't take a trade. And I literally, I just started talking about it. And so then a guy in the prop room heard me talking about it because you got to write an article for a magazine. I'm like, oh, right. Like, who's going to publish an article by me? Well, it turns out he worked for a famous trader. He was trading under a false identity. He knew all these editors. The next thing I knew, I had an article in a magazine. That was 2004. Right. And then people started calling, asking me to speak and talk about it. And all I did was take that science and then follow it. And connect it to what I knew about the mental challenges of trading and talk about it. Mm-hmm. And people just kept asking me to talk about it more. Yeah. So someone asked me to write a book that turned into the book that Brian Koppelman was like not happy about. <laughs> that's neat. That, that's pretty neat, right? Because like it was like the intersection of like academia and a trader. Like you kind of, you were involved in both where I guess, yeah, I, I guess not many people find that cross section. Um, and I guess, Denise, where you differ, right, from most of the other people with trading psychology, as you already mentioned, was the uh, using like emotions as data, um, as you like to put it, and we can't make a, de- uh, a decision without feeling. Um, I mean, it's it's a, it's scientifically uh, accurate, isn't it? Like this has been proven already? Yeah, I mean... So theoretically in science, you never prove anything. Like it would still be open to debate whether the sun rises in the East, you know, theoretically. But it's accepted among neuroscientists. And it's really not a question and hasn't been a question for at least 15 years, maybe 20. Like it, you have to have an emotion to make a decision. Now you may or may not recognize that you have mm-hmm. it. But if you think about it, like you do your analysis, whatever form of analysis you do, on whatever subject, but let's say this is the market, you come to some conclusion, but you have a feeling about the conclusion. Like, do you believe it? Do you have confidence in it? Does it resonate? And if you don't have that feeling, you don't act. Now you might be afraid like of the conclusion and you'll act to avoid whatever you're afraid of, but then you have fear and that causes you to act. But generally speaking, you do not you do not act based on the conclusion. You act based on your feeling about the conclusion, which generally is like, am I confident in my conclusion and its implications? So like in the original experiments, uh, Damasio worked with people who were brain damaged in such a way that they could, they only had cognition. And so like, they couldn't decide which day to make a doctor's appointment on. They couldn't decide what shirt to wear because they would just go round and round with like the reasons for Tuesday, the reasons for Wednesday, or the reasons for blue, or the reasons for green, like round and round and round and round and round until someone stopped them. Because they don't have any sense of what was right or appropriate or would work for them. So they're missing that feeling about the options. But I started going, I mean, once I started talking about this, I started going to something called the Society for Neuroeconomics, which is all these academics that basically study the brain on risk that's what neuroeconomics means Mm -hmm. and like to them it was like it was not a question you absolutely had to have emotion to make a decision i mean the other thing about it is it's not an either or it's not like intellect or feeling they're completely intertwined you know it's sort of like the weather right like you can't necessarily 
separate temperature and air pressure. You know, the, it, it's a system that works together. Mm -hmm. So. Right, right, right. No, it was fascinating. I, I remember reading the part. Yeah, like, in, like you were mentioning that the people who had that, that part of their brain damaged, like they couldn't even make a, a doctor's appointment uh, time. Um, uh, what, what else was I going to say? Um, oh, I, lost, I lost myself. Well, there. while you're thinking, let me say something. Yeah, yeah, people, go, ahead, go ahead. People tend not to think like one time I just put this out on Twitter for fun is confidence and emotion. A lot of people tell you it's not. Like it is basically, I mean, for simplistic purposes, for the average person trying to, you know, anything that happens below your chin, any physical sensation is going to be on the spectrum of senses, feelings, and emotions, which are just levels of intensity of something many scientists would call visceral intelligence. Mm. Intelligence that's moved into your body that you get some physical signal for. Well, if people are honest when they say they're confident or they're convicted, they know it because their body tells them, not their head. Mm. Now, if you're really out of touch with this, it's hard for you necessarily to find that. It's still true. Mm -hmm. And the flip side, so there's research um, there's a guy, I can't think of his name, but John Coates, who wrote a book, The Hour Between the Dog and the Wolf. And he was originally from Deutsche Bank. And then he went, got a PhD in neuroscience. And he did a lot of study on traders. Like he showed traders that are more interoceptive is the word, meaning they're perceptive about their internals. That's what it means, interoception. Okay. So if you can feel your heartbeat, feel your stomach growl, traders who have more interoceptive ability, make more money, last longer in trading jobs. Hmm. Why? Because they're more in touch with these, these pieces of information below their neck is giving. Yeah. Makes a ton, makes it makes That's a ton cool. of sense. Um, I, um, you know, one thing I did, Denise, and I, I've, I've said this on the podcast um, a lot. So the listeners um, already know, but like, you know, when I was playing poker and like, I was like really trying to search for an edge beyond just like the technical aspects of playing the game. Um, I gravitated towards meditation to like, you know, improve focus or just feel. And so like, I'm, I'm reading a lot, you know, I'm reading through your book and it's it's resonating me, with me from just my own experience of just getting more in tune, I guess, with myself and like what what I'm feeling. Um, I guess the, some of your clients meditate, or I guess guess your general thoughts um, on meditation in general. Uh, it's funny. I um, I think it. You know, first of all, what does it actually mean to meditate? Right? Like, there's a million different ways yeah, to do sure. it. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, if you assume it's like being quiet and letting your thoughts and feelings come through you. Well, by definition, you're probably going to be more aware of them that if you're constantly busy, I mean, they're probably there, but they're overshadowed by the other noise. So it's got to be helpful, like in terms of being able to recognize signals from your visceral intelligence. I personally don't meditate as a practice. I do think I have a very meditative mindset in that I'm basically always saying what am I feeling and why you know and I've learned very much to live by my intuition much more than I did even 15 or 20 years ago when I started this because I've learned there is a lot of science around intuition which is just pattern recognition based on your expertise mm -hmm. um so like I'm neither a fan nor a detractor of meditation. I'm like, if you're in a place where like being quiet specifically for a certain period of time helps you know more what you're feeling, not helps you let it go because that leads you down the wrong path. Right. It just helps you be more in tune with those visceral signals. Please, you know, like it's great. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, and that's, that's been the experience um, for myself. And so that's, it, it was really neat reading, reading the book and being like, and I don't know, maybe I'm like, uh, what's the word? Um, fitting. <laughs> I don't think I'm curve, like, full, like curve fitting. Yeah, I don't think I'm curving. <laughs> Seeing what you want to see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Correct, correct. 
I, I don't, I, and I don't think I'm doing that. I, I think like, uh, cause, cause I've seen it. I, I, I've seen it with myself and then it's, it's cool also to see from, uh, like a scientific standpoint as well. And I think they actually work very well, um, together and, uh, you know, they, they confirm each other. Um, while, while we're kind of on like the, the feeling, um, standpoint and confidence, um, I wanted to ask you about this, Denise, cause you know, I've heard a lot of traders say this and even traders we've had on the podcast that, um, a time, I guess, to be wary or to, you know, maybe they've had some of their worst trades is from when they were like very confident, like, oh, this is a slam dunk trade. Is that like, yeah. is so is that kind of like bordering on like, because I, I know in the book, you talk about like a spectrum of from like fear to like confident or I, I, I maybe right. I'm mis misquoting. But um, is that is that an instance of people being like, like arrogant or overconfident um, on the scale or just to speak to that? Yeah, I definitely work with all my clients individually or like if I do a hedge fund workshop or whatnot to build a, usually I call it a conviction spectrum. I actually think it's probably more accurately deemed a mental risk matrix, but to come up with all of the words that someone might have for confidence, conviction, I'm using those sort of synonymous, um, and the opposite. So like panic, terrified, afraid, worried, concerned, doubtful, et cetera. And, you know, the extreme. So one hedge fund we did a workshop with right before the pandemic came up with bulletproof. And they're like, when we start feeling bulletproof, we know we better get out. Like, you know, <laughs> when you're tempted, it's like, this has to work. We're going to kill it. You know, we're going to make 40% on this. And we want to like add, you know, like, no, that means get out. <laughs> <laughs> And I just, um, one of my clients, I don't remember which one, I think I remember which one, but I just had him doing this and he, well, he's actually a meditator in therapy, done psilocybin and is now working with me. When he did it, many of his words were intellectual. They weren't feeling words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he didn't have like an over, a lot of people use overconfident for that extreme level. Um, he didn't have that word. But as we talked through it on Monday, and I'll talk to him again tomorrow, he, I was like, wait a minute, we have to have the word that tells you, like, you're too sure. Because, you know, that means the chain is over, generally. Right. And, may, you know, I, I think about it, and JJ, maybe, maybe you know the movie, I, I forget it, it's one of those, it's one of those old kung fu flicks with Bruce Lee. And he he's training one of the young kids, and he, like, smacks him on the head, and he's like, don't think, feel. He, yeah. he said, don't think feel and I, that's what yeah. it made like i can't remember i don't remember the name of that one too but i remember that scene yeah um yeah no it's just it's just neat it, it, it's 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 real neat too and we were talking a little bit off camera um denise about like and you said this um it's like almost brings a relief to some of the clients when it's like uh you can feel <laughs> it's okay to feel and actually it's probably correct to feel in those first few years like I wrote that academic paper in 2003. I wrote the first article in 2004. I spoke at the, I guess it was the Chicago Mercantile Exchange in 2005, it must have been. And like, I had all these guys, floor traders come up to me afterwards and said, I've always used my feelings when I would tell anybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And my friend who was the floor trader originally who got me into the business, see, I said, he said, I told you. And then basically that's been happening ever since. I always use my feelings, but I wouldn't tell anybody. Like, and my thing is it really is a data set. Your brain is really using it. A lot of it's unconscious. And not, we've been taught not to use it, you know, to ignore it, not to use it, to override it. So let's suppose we even say, okay, I'm willing to use it. But then it's like, how? So I'm like, well, you can't get organized about it. And you can get like systematic about it now granted it's ephemeral data and it's got mixed signals but i don't know we put numbers on everything in the market but they're pretty damn ephemeral and they're pretty damn mixed so we're used to like interpreting numbers that conflict with each other and does this mean that well you can turn your attention inward and get better at sorting out these physical signals that your unconscious is giving you. And if you're an expert in anything or have a fair amount of expertise, it's gonna give you a certain kind of feeling 
when you recognize a certain scenario. And you're not going to necessarily know where it came from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're just going to have that sense of recognition. So you want to be able to know what that is. like, and, And to take that one step further, over the years, I've seen many of the most profitable trades come when someone has this feeling of, you know what, I'm just sure I'm seeing it. I'm sure I'm right. I'm sure this is the way it's going to play out. But I must be missing something because it seems too easy. Hmm. And when they're able to act on the shore, I'm seeing it and hold the, I must be missing something and, you know, keep an open mind to, are they? Usually they have trades that kill it. A guy that now works for me, John Burns, who was a floor trader for 18 years in whatever your Brexit was. I literally Mm -hmm. talked to him that day, the day they were voting. And he had that combination of feelings that it was going to pass and the British pound was going to do whatever. Like, you know, in the space of five hours, he like absolutely knocked the ball out. But it was those two feelings. He was sure he was seeing it and he must be missing something. Mm. But it's only as you start to listen to yourself and assume that all those senses, feelings and emotions that you're being given are data points. And it's your job to like sort them out like a jigsaw puzzle. And you practice doing it. Like another thing that happens if you're not resistant, a lot of people are afraid to feel their feelings, Mm -hmm. but if you're willing to feel them, like it actually gets kind of easier because you're Mm -hmm. going, you know, you're going with the tide is to Mm -hmm. fighting the mental tide. And you're like, oh my gosh, you know, once I, once you stop fighting gravity or, you know, ocean pressure or wave pressure, like actually it's easier. Right, right. Oh. Uh, ab- absolutely. Um, so, so Denise, uh, you're um, a- another thing that you mentioned in the book um, that I-, I really like a lot is about um, reading the market that like a-, a lot of people going into the market think they got to find something that everyone else doesn't know. They got to find that w- that one piece of information. And you argue, argue more for no, like this is like, you know, and you use a lot of poker examples and stuff too. It's like, it's about reading the other player, not maybe not necessarily about the cards that, yeah. um, that are being dealt. And, um, I believe this is called theory, theory of mind, correct? Theory of mind. Um, yeah. and, and you can, ex- you can expand on it a little bit. Uh, it's, you know, it's, I guess more or less the, the ability to like put yourself in another person's like head, like, uh, get an idea of what they're thinking and feeling. So yeah. um, I guess you can expand on that if I didn't give it adequate um, definition. And then two, I, w- I want to ask, like, how does one actually develop uh, their yeah. theory of mind capabilities? So generally speaking, everyone has theory of mind. Um, it does mean like a theory of the other person's mind. You use it all the time, walking down the sidewalk, particularly in New York City, or driving down a crowded highway, you know, like you get that sense someone's coming up on you, or you know you got to like, and that person's going to cut you off or whatever. Um, in, I guess it was 2006, this engineering student at Caltech, for his PhD dissertation, he was interested in the markets, and there was a big neuroeconomics uh, group at Caltech. He did this experiment. It's a long, complicated experiment. But at the end of the day, what they showed was the people who had greater theory of mind usage in their brain, you know, that were using the structures associated with theory of mind, were better at short-term price prediction. And they wrote an article like, this is the thing of great traders. I was already coaching and talking about it. But when I first read about it, first heard about it, I was like, that was the thing that my friend Don saw in me. And that was the thing that I that ultimately made momentum trading make sense to me. Like, I didn't care why they were buying Pfizer and Lilly and Shearing Plow at the time. I just saw on a Friday afternoon, they were all going up. Like, okay, somebody cares. Um, <laughs> well, because we all have it. I mean, you have less of it if you have like Asperger's. Um, but we do basically still all have it. You can use it. You just have to know, you know? So like if you learn to play, and I'm not, I mean, I like to play poker, but I'm not any good at it. Um, you should come play with us in New York. We're playing in a tournament. It's a charity tournament for hedge funds. But anyway, that's a good sign. Um, what was I gonna say? Like any poker player knows, like, you, you know, yeah, three aces is gonna be two kings and a nine, I think. I'm, I'm pretty darn sure. But <laughs> yes. like, you know, somebody can play those cards and the two kings and the nine wins, right? Like that mm-hmm. happens. 
Why? Because you read how they were playing them. I have, by the way, worked with a couple of poker players over the years. Not very many, but um, that's theory of mind. You're you're thinking about how what is that person? How are they playing their cards? What cards do they likely have given how they're playing? Mm -hmm. So, you know, why are the drug stocks all going up on a Friday afternoon? You know, and I will tell you, head, my hedge fund clients all talk about positioning. They really mean like that's a, one of their words for like, okay, <laughs> what's how is everybody else trading? You know, how's yeah. are people short in this or you know? But that's all it is. Is really you have a theory mm -hmm. of your opponent's mind because we have it naturally. Most of the time, you're not going to have to think about it. Like if you're driving down the highway or walking down the right. sidewalk. In poker, you do think about it. And in trading, you should think about it. Like why is, if you're gonna buy something here, why is someone gonna pay a higher price for it? Like you want you want to know the answer. Mm -hmm. Like maybe the answer is as simple as a lot of people are short this, you know, and it's just punch through a moving average to be really simple, like, you know, and they're gonna have to cover. That's certainly true in the hedge fund world. Like I had a client a few weeks ago, doesn't use charts, Totally fundamental, gave me a stock. It was Wayfair. Okay. And I looked at the chart and it had hit like 74 three times. And I just looked at it and I'm like, well, if that thing goes through 74, you need to be long it. He was like, what? <laughs> I'm like, think about it. Every time it's gone to like 74, it's full back. Like, you know, at some point the buyers are going to overtake the sellers at 74. A week later, it was 83. Yeah, because the and 74 was, seller is complete. Right, yeah, right. Everybody wants to sell 74 was done, and there are people yeah. short at 74 and now have to cover. Whoops, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but no one's taught to think about that in any sort of organized. I mean, that's what makes technical analysis work. Yeah. Like, it is just a reflection of other people's kind of relative perception right. of what's. Yeah. So I hope okay. I answered the theory of mind question. Yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting. It is like, um, I don't I I don't know if I'm getting this from your book. I, I I might be, but is it like, you know, being aware of ourselves and how we feel or like I guess putting ourselves in a scenario is what can like further the capacities because we know how we feel in a situation. Therefore, this is perhaps how the crowd is thinking in the scenario. There's some, you know, I don't know, flip side of the coin or exactly what it is, but the more you become self-aware the easier it is to sense how other people are feeling yeah. mm. you, you also actually don't have to think about it that much like mm -hmm. excuse me um yeah it just kind of happens like because i mean it's a normal natural human skill like i mean we don't offer this anymore alone, but we built this thing called an intuition brain game. And we actually built it based on that Caltech experiment. And that Caltech experiment was based on a 1944 psychology experiment where you saw shapes moving around a page. And they proved back in 1944 that people would impute a story to those shapes, mm -hmm. even though they seemed random. And sure enough, there actually was a story involved in the shapes. And if if you watch the shapes move and you just give the answer, like, because then it asks you where the shape's gonna move next. If you just give the very first answer that comes to you, chances are you're right. If you try to think about it, you're gonna be wrong. Mm. Um, and it's because the shapes are playing out kind of like human stories of, you know, fighting and, you know, love and conflict and whatnot. And you are familiar with all those things. Right. And you can see it in the way the shapes and like, you don't know it, but you know, that triangle is going to move up to the right to go get that guy or whatever, like, but you can't think about it. Mm -hmm. You just have yeah. to let your body tell you the answer. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. I, uh, you know, Denise, I think, I think the, um, the section of the book, I really, um, really enjoyed, or I, I think really uh, maybe hit me the hardest, um, or maybe something I would just wasn't perhaps like fully uh, educated on was the fractal uh, fractals. Mm -hmm. um, and 
I, I suppose it's a theory, but I know it's like a, it started as a, like a mathematical um, theory. And then you go on to say how like, okay, this fractals can apply to the mind um, yeah. is, is well, do, do you mind just sharing with the, um, no. the listeners? So let me see if I can do this and, you know, some, something that vaguely resembles the saint. So, you know, basically fractals in nature are like, think of a head of broccoli, you know, and the whole head looks like it looks, but if you pull off one stalk and you look just at the stalk, like that stalk, top of the stalk, while smaller, looks pretty much exactly like the head. So it's the same thing at a different scale is, you know, and they say coastlines are, but broccoli and cauliflower are sort of the easiest for everyone to relate to. Well, it means that smaller pattern, you know, repeats itself at larger scales. Mm-hmm. And it goes down to the tiniest little piece of broccoli. If you look really at it and then look at this, it's like it's the same. Well, so a long time ago, Freud came up with the idea, he called it the compulsion to repeat and said, human beings have a compulsion to repeat. He has this beautiful paragraph about it, but basically says, we get ourselves in the same situations with our bosses, or our spouses, no matter how the relationship starts and no matter how different the people see. That's what I did my master's thesis on was like the neuroscience of how that could be. And the short version is we learn kind of where we fit in a relationship and how we're supposed to operate in a relationship. And then we get with people who like allow us to do that and we recreate the same outcome. And we do that because we have patterns about that, you know, stored in our brains. Well, when I first started coaching, it was just about like using your emotions and understanding fear of missing out and fear of future regret. And I wasn't expecting to find Freud's compulsion to repeat. Mm -hmm. And I had this client who had solved this problem. Basically, they lost $10,000 every morning. They were off floor trade at the board trade, lost $10,000 every morning, made up to 30 during the day. They called me up and said, I've been doing this for years. If I stop make, losing the 10,000 in the morning, you know, I'd make three times as much because I wouldn't lose the 10 after make the 10 back and then make the extra 10. Um, <laughs> and out of not knowing what to do, and because I had a psychoanalytic background, I said, well, tell me your life story. And the life story was born to a 16 year old runaway who was on welfare, who got kind of adopted by the running coach. And then like the running coach was a pseudo father to him. He almost made the Olympics. I'm like, could you be repeating that life story in like every day's trading? The next month he made a hundred grand. He went off to make a million a month. Like by just seeing that he was repeating this emotional sequence. Mm -hmm. Fractals are the things in our perception that we apply to other people in situations. We think the other people are the other situation or the price action is going to treat us like people treated us growing up or is gonna be reflective of who we think we are and where we think we fit. And I am sure that the human psyche is fractal. Now, now, not when I wrote that book, but now the neuroscientists are sure you predict everything and you predict everything based on your past experience. So you learn some idea of who you are and how much money you're allowed to make and how you should make it and how you should behave and what you should do with conflict, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and how authority is going to treat you and the price is an authority. Right. And you react to what you learned. In other words, you predict what you should do based on what you learned. And the market is... The, you know, is, is the ultimate authority figure you know you might as yeah. yeah you're three years old and your father says no like and you're what can you do you know yeah so i say ultimately for people the objective is to know which feelings are about you and what you expect to happen to you which is going to be fractal and which feelings are actually about the trade mm. <clears throat> now the truth is it's nearly impossible to completely separate them because your brain is just trying to keep you safe based on what it expects for you and what it knows about the world and the markets outside of you. But the more you work on separating them, the closer you can come to separating that. And if you think about anything that anyone's good at, they have enough experience that they have confidence in their skill, whether it be markets or skiing or poker, you name it, 
And when they're in markets, poker, skiing, you name it, they are making decisions on their feelings about the problem at hand. They're not worried about themselves because they have the confidence that over time they will be okay. So they're not, they don't have this kind of safety alarm going off in the brain that's natural. Playing the piano, pick a thing, doesn't matter. Like you learn something, you gain confidence that you can, you know it and you can do it. And that confidence quiets the safety signal. So you don't have to have as many feelings about what's gonna to happen to me. And you can listen to your feelings about whatever the question at hand is. Yeah, that's awesome. I I, I love that. Um, I, uh, I I like to, there was, there was, a, there was a section, um, I don't know if it was in the same section, but it uh, it really resonated with me. And, and you, you put it, you put it very beautifully that um, like why I think it was like it was talking to like people's like love of the market and they don't know why they love the market so much. And 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 you and you suspect it's like our innate like um, our innate like want to grow into uh, yeah, ju just grow in general. And, and obviously you, you can expand on it um, better than I could. But that uh, that we all have that that the, that the market magnifies it like our you know, just puts everything under the magnif uh, magnifying glass, like we're talking about, um, because of the pressure, I guess, our brain on uncertainty. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't put I that mean, well, it, but at first, it's the ultimate game. I mean, there's no other game that's as hard from a mental point of view as trading. You know, no sport, and even not poker, because like poker, at the end of the day, you lay the hands down. You know, the hands, the, the cards mean what they mean. The hand is over. You get a break. You go on to the next one. Well, in trading, the cards, there are no, I mean, the cards never mean the same thing. You mm -hmm. know, they yeah. only mean something depending, you know, three aces mean something depending on what came before. Like, it doesn't mean, huh. I mean, that's true as you're laying the cards down, of course, but it's not true. In, you know, the market, there's nothing, there's no set meaning. There's no end of the game. If the ball goes backwards to take it to football or soccer, like it's bad, like it's not bad in in the markets. It's like, well, is this not? Does it mean it's going to matter? Is it not going to add? Like, and there's no. So, from a mental point of view, it's the very hardest thing there is to do. Now, you asked me another question in there, and I forget what it was. <laughs> um, Just. Yeah, I was just speaking to how, um, because you know Denise, I always and I, I know I've said this on the podcast plenty of times. Like when I, when I was going through poker, because you know I started with poker first, and, and I felt like it, it taught me a lot of these lessons before coming into mm. trading. And but I always thought that poker made me a better like under, me understanding poker and especially like the psychological side of it made me a better just human being in yeah. in general. Um, and so yeah, and, and you you mentioned that in the book how it really like it magnifies. Like, you know, we're talking about the fractals and stuff, and it really makes you, if you want to be good at these things, you really have to think, uh, you got to look at yourself. So I know you asked me about the self-development piece of it. So like yeah. people are, you know, can get addicted to the markets, right? Like the game is so compelling. Well, for, I think on the most superficial level, like if you win it, you know that you're, you know, you've won it against a whole bunch of people, right? Like it, it's such a competitive win. I mean, for lack of a better word, sure. but over the years, I don't, you know, I've just talked to so many people and even if they weren't really, really into like self-development, they end up talking about how it affects them and who they are. And, and I think, I mean, there is this ultimate game, ultimate mental puzzle so there's satisfaction in being able to solve it, but you solve it best the more you learn about yourself and the more you learn about interacting with this puzzle. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, uh, I don't know what percentage, but it's an awfully big chunk of why people are so, you know, smitten with it. Yeah. And I think that, that explain, I think that even like helped explain it a little bit for me as well um because it's like oh maybe it's just an innate thing uh, or whatever and i and i thought that's a a great explanation in itself um, well it's also you like it's you against you know when i first started trading like i had worked in the corporate environment and the job i had before i like went to graduate school 
I found they, they had said they'd never hire a woman and they never hire an IBM when they hired me as an experiment, but they told me that six months after I got there. <laughs> and like, you know, so there was a lot of politics and a lot of crap and they put me through experiments and it was not fun. You know, then I got there, it was like me and the screen. Like, it didn't matter what anybody else did. Like mm -hmm. it was me and those numbers, like, and there were no politics. So there's a certain sort of, you know, self-satisfaction. If you can win this game, like it doesn't matter whether someone likes you or doesn't like you. Or, you know, yeah. Or yeah. Whether using you as an experiment or not or whatever. <laughs> And then I guess I, the 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 funny part about um, trading too, and I know I know you highlighted this. Um, I guess like the irony of trading is that like most of the time it's painful. Like it's not it's not going to be comfortable. <laughs> uh, you could obviously lose money. Uh, you could be like, oh, I it, I closed it and it still ran, or you know, uh, vice versa. Um, I guess how you know for the listeners, how does how does one deal with playing a game where most of the times you're not going to feel good well the first is just to recognize that going in like it's really compelling and satisfying to play and to like think about the moves you're going to make and like make them and have them kind of start to work out but then like you get out of a trade and it could have gone further or you don't get out of a trade like you were just saying like most results end up with you feeling dissatisfied could have gotten more could have lost less could have given less back it doesn't matter you follow the flow chart like it's the rare occurrence that like you get in and you're really happy with the results like and there's no you traded it as well as you could possibly trade it well you just got to realize that's gonna gig so you're gonna be like annoyed or disappointed <laughs> most of the time <laughs> because if you know that then it's not a shock, you know, as opposed to like, okay, something moves for you, you're, you know, it pulls back, you want to protect your profits, you get out, and then like it goes back in your direction. I actually have a hedge fund client talking to me about this very thing with Novo, that the stock that apparently is the Ozempic and the, the, oh yeah, I was reading about and that. Apparently too. they got out and like it was up 20% yesterday or something and they're all upset. Well, like, you just got to know, because otherwise what happens is that, you know, I was in that, I didn't make that money. You jump back in at the worst possible moment. And then oh, you yeah. get the initial money you make. If you're yeah. expecting to be annoyed and expecting that you're not going to get out with the maximum profit, like, you're like, okay, well, chalk it up to another one. You know, what's next? Or even realistically in that situation, where is a decent place to get back in? As opposed to where's that, like, I just have to get back in because, oh, yeah, yeah. which is what most people do because they're trying exactly. to set their emotion aside. Because this is what really happens. And this is what science shows. If you set the emotions, try to set the emotion aside, number one, it gets more intense. And number two, the chances you actually act on it go up. Yeah. Where if you feel it and understand what it is, it gets less intense. And the chances you act on it willy nilly without making a choice go down. Mm hmm. Um, I, I want I want to ask you this, too, because, you know, um, you know, we, we have we have a trading room. So we're interacting with like a lot of uh, new traders. Um, I'm I assume I, I guess I'll ask you this first, Dina. So you you mostly work with people who are experienced, correct? Like you're not you're not working with the newcomer or or do you? Well, now. So I have this firm, you know, and I have three people who work for me as coaches now. But my clients now are professional portfolio managers. Okay. They haven't always been that. Um, we built a course recently in the past year. It's called Intro to the Trader Brain. It is to help everyone understand this psychological piece of it. Nice. But I also have three people, primarily two, who are former clients and former professional traders who work with, you know, we, we try to work with anyone who comes in the door if if we can fit them in. And Yeah. Okay. Well, because I, I figured I, want, I wanted to ask you like uh, two, I think like two questions kind of because, you know, we, we're dealing with more people new to the markets, maybe struggling. Um, and uh, one of the things I always say, people were like, oh, I want to make X amount a day or <laughs> I'm going to uh, stop, you know, I'm going to stop trading, you know, all, all these things. And it, it does. It drives me nuts, too. So I was glad to see your stance on this. Uh, do, do you mind uh, just sharing your thoughts on those? Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't mind if you're brand, brand, brand new. Like sure, you've been sure. doing it, you know, less than six months. If you say, look, I'm going to see if I can make a hundred bucks today, like, you know, but 
to do that kind of any sort of dollar per anything skews your perception ultimately. Like you want to be in the market when the market makes sense to you and out of the market when it doesn't make sense to you. And a dollar per anything. And I, I mean, I had a hedge fund guy who told me, you know, I want to make $5 billion this month. Like this was mid July. And I'm like, okay, stop right now. Cause it's never going to happen if you're thinking of it in those terms. Um, but the most important thing for a beginner is that you find some glasses, some set of lenses that make the market make sense to you in the mm -hmm. time frame that makes sense to you. Yeah. There are essentially an infinite number of ways to play the game. There are, you know, millions of players playing at different time frames for different reasons. You have to find something like, so when I first started and all these guys were trading for eights or trading back and forth in mean reversion. And I was like, these groups of stocks moved together and they moved two, three, four, five bucks. Why wouldn't I try to get the five bucks? Like, and Schoenfeld traded that way. So I went to Schoenfeld because they were trading that way. That made sense to me. Um, you have to find the way that makes sense to you. So what that means is people, you know, they sign on to learn from someone and maybe it makes, does make sense or doesn't make sense. So what happens though, is they never really ask themselves, what is this game? How does it make sense to me? What do I understand about it? Which are things I think you should write down on a Saturday afternoon. Like put your feet up, you know, it's summertime in North America, like outside on your deck, like what is this market and how does it move and what makes it move and how does it make sense to me? And what kind of overlays can I use to help me understand what's going on? And then once you think that's it, stick with it. So like back when I was at Schoenfeld and I was sitting next to Dimitri Reliasi, who I haven't seen in 25 years or 30 years, however long it's been now, but like they taught us, well, they didn't really tell us, but he thought to trade, like buy a hundred shares, buy another hundred shares, sell a hundred shares, buy 200 shares, sell, scale in and scale out. Yep. Because it that's solves the problem of, it does really solve the problem of things move back and forth and you can't, you know. Yeah. And my understanding, he did not tell me this personally, but someone on my desk told me that he spent like two or three years practicing scaling in and scaling out. Scaling out. Because it solves so many of the problems. Of Definitely like, because you, yeah, because you're always taking off risk and you're always cashing out. Right? Yeah. I mean, and, that's, and that's, well, and you're like, you know, you're, you're never going to lose a ton. A ton. Yeah. But then you can also be, you know, at that point, 300 shares all in when it really starts to move. But like you yeah. learn the waves and the And you price learn action. the dynamics. Exactly. Right. You know, yeah. like you short the backfill and then when the backfill's over, you cover. Right. Yeah. I wish I would have learned that the way he learned it at the time. I mean, I still, I did kind of do it, but I didn't spend like two or three years just trying to learn to do that. For whatever reason, he saw that that made sense and he learned to do that. And mm -hmm. about five years ago, someone who used to work for him took me out for drinks and I told him that story and go, oh, he still trades that way. Like he has all his <laughs> analysts doing all his stuff, but he still basically moves in and out of names and builds positions or takes some yeah. off or adds some. Yeah. Um, but I use that to say like there are, I mean, I have clients who trade, you know, fundamental mm -hmm. earnings. What's a stock going to do? Like on the day they announce the earnings, this is what it should do. They wouldn't know a chart if they tripped over it. I have other clients, like I have one client who's very long-term, trades international equities for three to five years, but the last thing he does is look at a chart. Like, you just got to figure out how this game makes sense to you and then stick with it and play it when it's making sense to you and don't play it when it's not making sense to you. And I'm going to be blasphemous here. Mark Douglas was wrong that you got to do 20 trades in a row with no emotion like that you have to, that's oh, a that's computer can do that yeah. you can't do it you can't and like no, those 20 trades aren't equal no yeah no the, that that's now uh, i'm really in trouble someone will hear that and i'll get some nasty email oh, oh, whatever. Oh, whatever. no i mean we're a fan but i mean there are certain things that people say sometimes that you know it, you know there's a lot of good he did say and then that I, I actually I don't I don't agree with that either. I hired Mark to help me. 
I, I did try to hire him, if I remember correctly, because I, I talked to him and Ari Key when I ran the desk in New York. In 2005, I was in an event in Las Vegas that he was a speaker at. And I sat down and said, you know, I've started talking about the psychology of this. I'm just wondering what you think. And he told me the story of writing one or two of his books. And that man, there's no more sincere man to have ever walked the face of the planet. He poured his heart and soul into like, how does this work? How does the mm -hmm. brain interact with it? And did the best, I mean, honestly, blood, sweat and tears into the best job of explaining what it was and how to interact with it. I think that anyone could do. He didn't have any brain science about you have to use emotion and predicting. Right. He didn't, like he didn't, it didn't exist when he was writing those books. Mm -hmm. So without that, I mean, no one could have been more sincere, worked harder. Like, so, I mean, I have the utmost respect for him but he didn't understand that some of the things that we now understand about perception and judgment. Yep. Yep. Shout out, shout out Mark Douglas. Um, I guess another thing I wanted to ask you too, Denise about, um, you know, for like a beginner and I, I have like a hard time. Um, maybe she's a hard concept to grasp. I think, uh, you know, relaying this to, to beginning traders or struggling traders is like the value of having a plan, but, remaining flexible within the confines of the plan um is this just something someone has to experience or themselves or you you something you gain over time or I, I don't know how else to get through to people on this well who is it you know mike tyson said everybody has a plan to get punched okay. in the face <laughs> yeah. Exactly. yeah yeah like you or have I love to all have Sorry, I was gonna say I love all your like quarterback examples too. I think that's such a great uh, applicable like sports examples as well. You have all these yeah. plays, but like someone's coming at you, you better like scramble. Yeah, yeah, you gotta improvise. You yeah. Know? Now I had a hard time with that because I'm very organized, like rule following, show up on time, cross the T's, dot the I's kind of girl. Like I, I thought I'd be a good girl, you know, and never get in trouble and all that sort of stuff. And when I was trading at the original prop firm, one day the owner called me up and said, buy 5,000 shares of Kmart. Now, first of all, it was down like $2 on the day and it was a $5 stock at that point. So like it went against every rule that I had. Yeah. <laughs> like in every rule that, that, by the way, the man had taught me. Yeah. And I'm like, Bob, I don't have enough capital in my account. He's like, just buy 5,000 shares came out. I'm like, Bob, I don't have enough. He goes, I'm the owner of the firm. You have enough capital to buy the 5,000. So, so I'm like, okay. So I buy, he says, buy 5,000 more. I'm like, what? So I do it <laughs> because he was like a reversion to the mean. It had gapped down. It's going to come back. It didn't come back, by the way. Yeah. I lost some money. I was wrong. I knew he was wrong. Um, but he was trying to teach me that there are opportunities that aren't exactly. Now, I did not really learned that lesson until I don't remember what day it was, but it was somewhere in the 2008, nine, 10 realm. And at which point I'd already been trading 15 years. And it was in the afternoon. I remember and the S and P's gap down, like, like they were trading and then they were down like 40 points, like just in the next second. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the flash crash, but, um, I was like, I don't know what's going on here, but like, and it, you know, it gone through my stops. Now my impulse was just to get out. Cause like, then I'm like, wait a minute, like you're not going to have to get out. Like there, well, I don't know what's going on here, but, and I watched a trade, you know, I ended up making money on that trade. Now, does that mean, you know, things gap hugely against you and you should just stay in? No, no. but whatever the <laughs> conflict circumstances yeah. were at that moment, I just, thought it was a pretty good likelihood that that drop was going to reverse at least somewhat. And I didn't have to lock in that stop. Now you have to have experience. I mean, I have lots of examples like that, but you have a strategy, you yeah. have a set of tactics, and then you have to react to what's being given to you. Now you have to have some risk management. Definitely. Like, I mean, even at the 40, 40 point S and P drop, if I took them a lot, it would have been painful, but like it would have hardly wiped my account out or anything, you know, like, um, so I wasn't, I conversely, I have a, had a long-term private equity, private placement that I did like wipe out a big account because <laughs> I, it was actually, I, I listened to the, what effectively was inside information and believed it when I should have listened to the chart, but, um, by the way, the chart will tell you, <laughs> the chart will tell you because it's the sum total of everybody's perception. 
Right. Now it's a little bit different now, I think, because I think the machines are so active. But you know, at the end of the day, there's no two trades that are exactly alike. And they really aren't. Mm -hmm. So this idea that we can sit there and wait for the exact same thing to happen, you know, with the exact stop and the exact, it's like, it's not the actual game. It's like the kindergarten version of the game. Like actual, what it's called, true range, average true range. Yeah. How much this, which volatility, how much it's moving over, you know, a period of time. I mean, during the financial crisis, I remember like the Dow was moving 300 points on a one minute chart. The average true range is 300 points. Well, so if the average true range is 300, minute, 300 points on a one minute chart, like you can't have a 200 point stop. Right. <laughs> you have to be right. willing to go in with like a 500 point stop or else you're definitely getting stopped out. So there's different personalities on different days. Yeah. Having said that, you could start with training wheels, like and step into it, find some set of factors that make sense to you, get the feel of them. Right. You get the feel of reading people, get the feel of skiing, get the feel of playing the piano, get the feeling of cooking spaghetti. Like that's what you do. You take the facts and you come up with some amalgamation of your own interaction with those facts that allow you to deliver a good performance in poker, trading, skiing, cooking spaghetti, whatever. Like that's the way things are. And if this is the same, the markets are even more so that way because it's just a bunch of people reacting to whatever just happened. There's no truth. There's zip, not a no truth. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, that's what makes it so fascinating. That's what makes it so fascinating, but I guess tough at the same time. Um, Denise, uh, I understand correctly you're working on a new book. Yeah? I am. Do, do you have anything you want to share uh, with the listeners? The working title is The Emotion Paradox. Um, and it's about how to use all your emotions. Like and to not worry about positive thinking and particularly not to be scared of your so-called negative emotions, fear, frustration, and disappointment. Like the world has made those emotions bad, but at their core, they're meant to give us some peaceful, useful information so we do better next time. But at the stage of, you know, whatever the world, everybody, you know, they could feel afraid or frustrated or disappointment and then they have to go guilty and ashamed on top of that. Like you don't. At, in their pure form, those feelings are meant to help you and you need to be willing to feel them and then learn how to understand them. So that's what it's about. When I when that book is actually available is a very open question because I'm just so busy that I don't get enough done on it. And that's mm -hmm. been the case for like three or four years. Mm -hmm. How how long did the, the, the first book uh, take you to complete? Just, I'm just out of curiosity. I wrote it in a year on weekends and holidays okay. and every other Wednesday. <laughs> okay. All right. Nice. Um, I guess I got, um, yeah, I got two more questions. I got two more questions. One on topic, one off topic. Um, I'm, I'm curious cause you, you do, you do work with athletes. I've always thought there's a lot of similarities. I think you do agree as well. Um, just, you know, could you tell listeners maybe the differences in the similarities between working with traders, um, and athletes? Well, the biggest is like an athlete's job is to make the thing happen, right? It's like to pitch the pitch or win the race or, you know, connect with the receiver. Like it's their job to make something happen. A trader's job is to react to what's happening. Mm -hmm. So they're mm -hmm. very, very, very different, like mm -hmm. from the mental point of view. Um, having said that, both parties can like practice their craft and understand what strategy and tactics they're going to use mm -hmm. presented with a set of circumstances. And then hopefully the set of circumstances allows them to execute their craft. And in both of those, there's going to be, you know, fear of failing, fear of missing out, fear of future regret, which is the more important, like if I do this, I'll lose or I'll lose money or I'll be embarrassed. Like every athlete I know has the, like, they need to win, you know, for their career, but they're always worried about like, what's the crowd? What are the fans? What are the sponsors going to think of them? Mm. So there's this fear of future regret. It's just in a, 
you know, their job is to make to make something happen and avoid that, where the trader has to react and navigate. Like this, the two surfing, I think, is the most similar sport to um, trading. Okay, because you're out there waiting for the wave to come and have to figure out how mm -hmm. you have to paddle and like the waves going to see be that. Mm -hmm. But it's still there's still a physics to surfing that like which there is not to the market right mm -hmm. you know like i mean it can be perfectly sunny and a storm comes up in five minutes in the market or one minute for that matter you know the day the doubt uh, the s and dropped 40 points um but at the end of the day all the work i do is helping people sort out what are they feeling and why and learning to work with that internal dictionary that has you know, senses and feelings that have meaning and being able to sort through that. Within that, there's understanding their own feelings that they show up with about themselves and what can they expect. I mean, I have a client who was in a fixed income desk at Goldman Sachs and now is at a hedge fund. And, you know, from a fixed income desk at Goldman Sachs, that person has seen a lot of stuff in the fixed income world, right? Mm -hmm not completely sure that what they know works as a hedge fund portfolio manager. I use that to say like any average person is gonna go, oh, come on, <laughs> right? Like 50, 10 years ago, Goldman Sachs, like, come on, like, you know so much and so many people, you know, and like, how could you not? Yeah. But they're just like every other human being. Like, will I exactly. be able to do this in this new challenge? Yeah. And I can tell you, I haven't met a human being yet that doesn't have a part of their psyche that like has self-doubt. It's part of the human psyche. It's part of our makeup. And on some level, it's helpful because if we try to resolve like, okay, I'm not sure I can do this. Okay, what do I need to do to be able to do it? What do I need to learn? What do I need to practice? What do I need to work on? Like in its pure form, it's just trying to help us. Now it will be exaggerated based on our history and based on, you know, our older brother telling us we were stupid or whatever our gig is because <laughs> we've all got them. Like, but it's part of the human condition. And at its core though, it's just meant to help you like figure out what you need to do to get the thing you want. All right, last question here, Denise. Um, you mentioned you're from Ohio. Uh, I, I think I've seen you tweet about the Browns or you have in the past I have okay um I was gonna let's let's put your uh let's see your brain on uncertainty here the Browns I'm, I'm a bit of a better sports better um <laughs> I actually I actually have a long shot bet on the Browns actually to win the Super Bowl um I I kind of like I like the coach um I think people forget how good Deshaun Watson is actually as a quarterback um, now he's got time to actually practice. He didn't practice last year, was away from the team. Um, their win total, so their over under win total is nine and a half. Are you taking mm -hmm. unbi try and like remove your fandom uh over or under nine and a half wins? The next time I bet on the Browns, Jimmy Haslam will not be the owner. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. Not a not a fan of the ownership. I'm I'm done with the Browns till Haslam sells the team. <laughs> and I, and you know, y yes, there were more die hard, die hard fans of the Browns, but definitely if you go through my Twitter until, you know, two years ago or whatever, like, you know, that snatch, snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Like, there's all kinds of reasons for why I just said what I said, but like, they have a very large collective self-image program. I mean, mm -hmm. problem, not program. Well, program. They actually do have a collective self-image program. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I mean, I have come very close multiple times to being invited in there to work with them. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Very close being the operative word. Like, but at the end of the day, they always end up saying the same thing. Well, they always did say, but like, we've got it under control. Yeah, I'm not quite so sure you do. You'll believe it when you see it. But yeah, I just had it with Haslam. So, yeah. Oh man. So sorry. Yeah. I like I like the coach though. I like the coach. I think he's a 
a good football coach. I'm a bit of a football. Yeah. I don't really know what to think of him. And I've stopped analyzing it. Like he sure seems like he's got potential, but then again, so I don't know, you know, and over the years I've been interviewed about the Browns. I mean, I have some articles there. Well, probably one up here that you can't see, like, some of the Browns reporters would call me every year and interview me. And I've been in the Akron Beacon Journal and the Cleveland Plain Dealer and whatnot. So, you know, I also got like inside the locker room information from reporters and whatnot. And Mm -hmm. let's just say at the end of the day, I think they could have better risk decision-making skills. Sure. (laughs) Well, I, I, I already saw people, um, the, uh, the big contract they gave Watson, that was a, you know, we talk about, uh, risk decision making that was a um maybe a quite i mean i think he's a good talent like i i you know other issues other you know that's other s- scenario but as far as talent wise i think he's a he's a great talent but with all that other stuff going on um that was my final straw by the way like yeah. that decision was my final straw yeah uh yeah, but and as we all know you know it takes a lot more than talent sure uh, absolutely i mean i'll go back you know I was never a Baker Mayfield fan. I became a little bit more of a Baker Mayfield fan because I was so mad at how they treated him the last year. Mm-hmm. Like, um, yeah, this is this is it's, it won't be as bad as Billions, but don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ba- Baker's in Tampa. We'll we'll see how that goes. Um, but uh, it was good. I was at least uh, uh, happy to see him. Um, he when he went to the Rams, he had like a he had a really good comeback. Um, I don't know. I was just good to see. I, fa- I found myself rooting for him. I was watching that first game when he was with the Rams. Now was I was an Odell. I was an Odell Beckham fan. Also. Okay. Yeah. Like, and I actually I've never talked to Odell himself. I had I did become friends with like I don't know if he's really his agent, but he's a childhood friend who's really around him and. So I, I had a lot of conversations with that person through the through the Browns years, through the LA years, like, and I'm basically still an Odell fan. I think if he were given the right psychological environment, which includes like the relationship with his quarterback, mm-hmm. um, I mean, I could be wrong, but um, yeah. So I had to give up on the Browns once before when Modell sold the team. Mm-hmm. So in fact, I was trading at that prop firm and I used to go in on Sunday afternoons and read the charts. And it was before like everybody had a cell phone and I got home and my answering machine was like, you know, on fire. And it was all these guys I traded with like saying, oh my God, what are you going to do? And I'm like, what are they talking about? <laughs> well, it was the day that Modell had, had announced the Browns were going to Baltimore, but I missed it completely because I was in the office uh-huh. looking at charts. Um, and then I thought they were kidding me. Like this was some big joke that all these guys played on me. So of course I turned the news and I found out it's true. I'm like, okay, I'm not watching the NFL. I did not watch it at all until the day they came back, which was my birthday, sitting in 50 yard line club row seats and they lose 43 to three to Pittsburgh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it just, you know, there comes a point where like, you just have to give up. You just go. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah. And well, oh, by the way, and I don't think Haslam is going to sell it because he's going to give it to his kids. And so, like, you know, I'll have to be reincarnated as like, I don't know, <laughs> to be a Browns fan again. Because it, no it's gonna... it's tough for football. You know, it's funny. I was actually I was talking with someone today about this. That like football, I think, is like the one sport where like ownership, like the top down, like it really matters, like from ownership to coaching. I think it matters way more than um, other sports. Um. Yeah. There's just there's just more decision making in football and there's more there's more strategy there's more where the other sports are kind of more on the fly like there's a lot of like impro- uh you know improvising like you have plays but not really in the sense where football stop start like stop start calling plays um so one of the things i've been told and i obviously don't know if this is true but you know through that cadre of reporters that i got to know then a few players but is that has limit crucial points has gotten too involved in the decision making. Yeah. And I think that's probably not that hard to believe. You know. No, it's not. I think you know, we see like Jerry Jones it looks like Jerry Jones is that way. Um certain owners I guess get that type of reputation. I mean maybe there's some hope for you Denise. They got Schneider out of DC. Um they ran him out so I don't, I, don't... <laughs> I mean 
you know, it's like one of those things. If the Browns called me, could I say no? <laughs> no, right? No. Not. no. Although I would, I would never actually, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't even have the time. Like I had a conversation with another professional team this year and I gave them a proposal and actually the, per the person doing the work was John Burns, the former, because I couldn't do it. Um, I, it would be hard to say no, but I would actually hope that I could. <laughs> have you, um, ha have you or your team, have you guys worked with uh, professional teams? Um, we have. Are you allowed to share with teams? The only one we're allowed to share is not one that, well, uh, people will know of it, but is NASCAR, it's Hendrick Motorsports. We worked with oh, Pit Crews. Cool. Cool. Um, I gave a talk at something called Leaders in Sport, which is like an organization where assistant GMs and, you know, assistant head coaches, like the, the head coaches and the GMs don't come, but like everybody around them comes to this thing. Mm -hmm. And I told them, this talk's online, by the way, and I think you can get it, but um, if anything you want through your athletes, you can get through a different approach to fear, frustration, and disappointment. And then out of that, this head of human performance from Hendrick Motorsports, his name, Andy Papa, well, he actually has a long Greek name, but he goes by Andy Papa, called me and said, would you work with our pit crews? And so we did for two years. And they run the first race after our first oh, race. Nice. And they gave us some credit. Because, you know, these guys have to jump over this wall, change a tire, fill the gas in like 13 seconds or 12 seconds or 11 mm -hmm. seconds. And I think now yeah. they've gone to one lug nut, so it's down from that. And they are nervous, you know, and they don't, you know, it is like high stress and they do have to work together. And so we just taught them to like, channel that nervousness into energy like not to try to not to try to shove it aside not to try you know that you're going to be afraid like you're under this crazy amount of pressure in a very short period of time and some of the guys are like oh my god so what happens when you're like nervous or afraid and you can just name it i'm worried that like typically it actually dissipates or the intensity goes down as opposed mm -hmm. to the opposite. So when they all started admitting they're like worried about jumping over the wall, they actually were more efficient and faster. Yeah, excellent, awesome. So with that, that's going to conclude today's episode of Confessions of a Market Maker. If you guys enjoyed this episode, can you please rate and review it for us? If you'd like to join a supportive and professional community of traders, you can join us at microefutures.com. Denise, uh, let the listeners know where they can find you or uh, anything else in general you yeah. want them to know. So my company is The Rethink Group and the website is therethinkgroup.net. You can get to a couple of others that one's a church group and one's an HR firm or two HR firms. But in any event, therethinkgroup.net, um, send us a contact us. I'm still on Twitter, even though some people give me a hard time about that. Denise K, my just my middle initial show. Um, yeah. All right. Thanks Excellent. for having me. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks for being so uh, gracious with your time um, and thorough with your answers. Really appreciate it. So for Denise show, I'm Paulie Walnuts. He's a gorilla of House Street. Use stops though. <laughs>